my approach to this particular topic will actually be to set you up to fail. Now, normally you don't announce that in advance, right? Particularly not if everybody's been working a long day and is looking forward to dinner. I know that I'm standing between you and dinner. I'm well aware of that. And I know that I'm also standing between you and football. So I even, I'm, I'm keenly aware where I stand in the packing order of things. But the reason that I want to approach decision making in that particular way is because I think there is a real danger when we address the issue of decision making under conditions of complexity and uncertainty that we tend to jump into these decisions because we live in a very busy world where we are connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week through all sorts of technological tools and gadgets and others. And it actually makes us worse decision makers than better decision makers. So let me take you on a tour through a couple of things that I would like to talk to you about. If you think of decision making as a science, then the field of decision science has, I have at least 200 books in my library that are prescriptive books about decision making. How to make better decisions. The seven steps to making the best decisions. Decisions you will never regret. All those wonderful books that you see in the airport that instantaneously will improve your life when you purchase them. And then you realize it's not really your life that you're improving, but the person who wrote the book. If, you're, if you have an interest in the theoretical work behind it, um, in Economics 101, or introductory classes, we talk about utility theory all the way back from Adam Smith, 1776. That has been our guiding idea. But prospect theory is Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And Daniel Kahneman is an interesting name. I, I strongly urge you, if you have an interest in decision science and decision making, to read his work. He's a psychologist who several years ago received a prize in economics, a Nobel Prize in economics. And that is an unusual combination, I think. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. His findings are in the sense that we are risk averse in gains. So you, st you sell your winning stocks too soon. And we see risk seeking when we are in a losing position. You hold your losing stocks too long. And you rationalize yourself out of the bag every time. Not you, other people, of course, but from your private responses, I can see that we have something there. So here it is about decision making. Nothing is more difficult and they're more precious than making good decisions coming from a man who was a star on both sides of the equation. Some of the greatest blunders and some of the brilliant steps. So why we all recognize, why we all recognize that decision making is so important, the remarkable thing is that we don't get any training. I don't know how many of you play golf. Can I see quick hand? Anybody play golf here? Try to play golf, pretend to play golf, anybody. Please help me out. Anybody play soccer, football? Any sport, you guys need to get out more, all right? <laughs> you don't have that life work balance thing down. But in almost everything, we don't hesitate to get a trainer. How many of you had a designated class in high school and an age when you could have used it most about making good decisions? Very few of us, very few of us. Decision making is considered to be innate and we don't seek help. Today we have more choices, and as you may know from the literature, more choices means that we have more anxiety about making choices and that we lead to regret faster. If you have only two choices, it's clear. One is unbelievably ugly and the one is okay. All right, you have no more regret after this. If you have 100 choices, as soon as you have made a choice, you already regret that you didn't take the other ones. And you can see people sometimes going around like mad men trying to find out what that is. So in business school, if we are at Wharton, we teach tools. And I understand that many of you have an engineering background. And so you know tools to the nth degree. 
You can do stochastic modeling. You can do all sorts of wonderful model building. And yet, that is what we focus on in marketing, in finance, in accounting, any of it in the business schools. We look at the tools that we can get for you. Now, Herbert Simon is the author of the concept bounded rationality. I can give you the academic version, but let me, because at the late hour of the day, give you the non-academic version. What we have between our ears is very limited. We'll do a test right here. Now, I don't have your name badge, so that's kind of, you, you expected something like that happening already, <laughs> so you were prepared. But whatever your name is, 27 times 36 is? <laughs> and the answer over here was, I don't know. And that, I hope, is always the honest answer and true. I'm always afraid that one of these days I'm going to run into one of these people who has that insane ability to give you the answer right there. All right, I have never met one like that. Yet, if you take your cell phone out, it's six hits on your calculator, and you would have the answer. I have no clue what the answer is. I just pulled it out of my head. But when you come home after you've been on the road for a week, and you meet your partner, your spouse, one muscle in his or her face will tell you volumes about what the reception will be like. Would you agree? I don't want to know. Some of you want to share. Yes, I have one. Every time I leave, she gives me this or he does that. I don't want to know. It's not a counseling session. But I want you to understand the difference. This one about the mathematical one is about a sequence, is about a tool. The other one, reading emotions and reading faces is something that we as human beings are very good at. This pattern recognition is our strength, to know whether we're friends or enemy. All right, that is a key part of our learning. So while it is sometimes painful for us to realize,